Welcome. This is Math 264 at Delta College. This is Monday, May 24. It's our first class session, and first sessions are always a little crazy or hectic, so be patient with me today. Uh, this class is Math 264, section SP810, spring section. And everything that we do in this class is on my website, which we'll tour briefly in a short time. So whatever it is you're missing, it's on my website. And this is the address to my website. And I've brought that in a couple of emails to you already. So it's possible you've already looked at my website. This course is called Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations. So every word's important right here. Introduction means we're not going to teach you everything there is to know about ordinary differential equations because you could spend your whole life doing this and it would be a life well spent. But the goal of such a class, tr traditional sophomore class in mathematics, traditionally the fourth class in the calculus sequence is to prepare you to take differential equations in whatever field you're advancing to, economics, psychology, uh, engineering, mathematics, chemistry, however, other people consume differential equations, and you'll see that all those people do consume differential equations. This math class is a traditional class taught by mathematics departments to serve the other departments to introduce their students to the concept so that they can apply it in their chosen field. A uh, question was posted about how to best consume this Zoom recording. And what I'm doing is recording this session and focusing the recording on my paper. So no matter what you do at your desk during this session, and you can always interrupt me and ask me how to fix something on your desktop, I do not see your desktop. Whatever you are consuming on your desktop, I am recording this piece of paper, and that's how it should come out when I post the recording later. If you click on speaker view, You've got my beautiful blue fractal because I'm not always present on camera. I don't expect you to be present on camera uh, just for fun. Let's be present on camera for a short time. That's me, hello. And even though I'm looking at myself on this camera, my recording is still recording just this paper. So you can bring video or not bring video. Sometimes, especially during office hours, if you show me video of the work you're doing, that's kind of helpful. Uh, or if you make a video of the work you're doing just to explain things, that's usually faster than trying to describe them or write them in an email. Sometimes I will pop over to my whiteboard here. And so I could do that by putting the whiteboard and the paper together. And I'm not an expert at this, but I'm pretty sure that it is recording both the whiteboard and the paper when I do this. So I'm just trying to say to you, what you choose to see on your desktop is not the same as what I'm recording. You using Zoom can choose to see anything you want to. Uh, if you focus on David's paper, then you'll always be seeing David's paper. And you can choose to keep that always present. If you focus on David's whiteboard, then you can choose to see David's whiteboard and once in a while we'll go over there, but most often we'll be on paper. If you choose to focus on David Redmond, you'll see this uh, very fascinating fractal. This is called a fractal. It's a, I think it's a Julia set. So uh, if that helped out the group, you can you know just toss an acknowledgement in the chat or go on. If it didn't help you out, you can just uh, ask more questions on the chat. So I'm going to stop recording my whiteboard here, just kind of unpin it in Zoom language. Once in a while, I'll share my computer screen or uh, you can double click on, you can double click on cells to focus on them, so to speak. Yes, that's true. Uh, shared in the chat. Once in a while, I'll bring you to my computer screen in general or 
to just a window on my computer screen to illustrate something for you. And we'll start by doing that pretty quickly, but most of the time I'm gonna be sitting on this paper. Uh, everybody's got issues right now with, you know, connection speed, quality of video, quality of audio. Usually that's not a major problem, although I'm not excited about the quality of my connection speed here. Even if things are not coming across to you in the live delivery, the recording should be solid. So don't worry about something getting interrupted or freezing. Usually the recording should be solid. And if you observe a case where it's not, you let me know. If you by chance get kicked out of this because of connection speed or failure of my equipment or yours, the Zoom meeting will try to reacquire you. So uh, don't worry, you can either rejoin or wait for a moment and the Zoom meeting will try to reestablish itself with all the participants that were present at that time. Okay, so let's get rolling. Again, you, you throw questions in the chat anytime you want to, I'll answer them in the order I observed them. You can always break into the audio and just shout out question. <laughs> If I'm not uh, observing your question in the chat or otherwise, uh, there's no problem if you want to interrupt me. Uh, I guess you don't know my name except for Dave. It's, my name is Dave, Dave Redman, and uh, I'm relatively informal. And so Dave or David is fine with me if you want to uh, break in with a question. Let's take a short tour of the website. And as I've hinted right here, it simply won't be short enough, but there's a lot of things we have to do to get you rolling on the first day before we can actually have some fun solving differential equations. So let's share a screen. Let's go over to my website. And this should be present on your screen right now. You can break in and tell me if it's not. And size, of this type on your screen probably depends on your screen and your setup. I have a separate monitor here in front of me where I'm looking at what I think you're looking at. And that gives me a clue as to whether things are working. So as far as I'm concerned, I think you're looking at my week one webpage, which is what I intended. Let's just start at the base on my website and you can come to Dave's web corner. You can find out how to contact me by hitting contact. You can find out what I'm teaching this semester by hitting semesters. Right now I'm only teaching one class, this class here in the spring semester and not again till fall. You can, uh, sometimes I collect other things. You can investigate other things I've collected under mathematics. I've been retooling my website considerably recently to make it like highly or as accessible as possible. So there's a lot of content I haven't posted that I'm bringing back, but you're, you're, you're uh, welcome to explore anything here. Let's go to semesters. Let's go to our class. You might as well just book the homepage of our class, which you're looking at right now. And in this spring 2021 semester, this is the homepage, Math 264. You can review our syllabus, our resources, or see an outline for all six weeks. On the homepage here, you'll always see an introduction to what we're talking about this week, but the introduction is slightly more extended this session. Notice you can join this class session by clicking on class session. So these Zoom links are open uh, there, apparently, there's not a lot of people trolling around the internet looking for differential equations classes to disrupt. If I notice some, then I'll take this password protected, but uh, ease of entering is okay with me. Office hours, you likewise can just join by clicking this link. And my office hours are Monday through Thursday, 11 to 12, or by appointment. It's possible you're not even listening to this until later tonight. If you like to make an appointment with me, I have no problem. 
just send me an email say, are you around David Monday at three? Are you around David Tuesday at six? If I'm unavailable, I will be honest and say so. If I'm available, then we'll just say, okay, uh, come and meet me Tuesday at six in the office hours that you can click on right here. So trying to make things accessible. Uh, YouTube channel will contain all class session recordings and uh, I'll take you by there later. Homework and exams are all submitted to a Dropbox folder called Math 264 Assignments. If you click on that Dropbox folder, you just get a form page that lets you drag and drop files. And then after you add a file, uh, dialog boxes you won't see when I demonstrate this, but let me just add a simple file for my computer. Uh, let's see, are there any harmless files on my computer? So I'm looking at a dialog box right now and Zoom window sharing does not open the dialog box for you. So I have uploaded something. I now type in my name. You see what I uploaded, some exercise I had created. And my email address. And got it, got it, upload. You get a confirmation that you just uploaded a file. On my side, in my email box, I get a confirmation that someone just uploaded a file. It's got your name and email as you presented it, and it has a timestamp on it. So when we talk about deadlines later, that's a good demonstration of how I know when you handed something in. So uh, I haven't had anybody it's a, it's a fairly simple system to implement. So I, if you have any questions about it, let me know as we go along. I'm looking for something. So short introduction to week one. I'll let you read this as you wish because we're gonna say these words anyway in a short time. And then here's an introduction to the whole course. An outline of all the sections that we're gonna cover in this course. And, and there's a fair number of sections here. I think if we count them all, 15, 20, 25, 30, 34 sections. I've said in an email before that I kind of front loaded them, which makes week one even more hectic. But chapter one is basically review and preparation. Chapter two is our first implementation. And then we'll get into more serious things as we go down the line. I'm not married to this schedule. So if we're short, by a section and I'll just move it down the line or move it up the line, which usually doesn't happen. But this is the pace that I'd like to take so that I can spend a responsible time on the more important sections that we come to at the end. You can investigate each one of these week, weeks just by clicking on the week or clicking on the link to the week here or the link to the week every time you log into our homepage. Oh, login is a strange word for me because I put everything in the open. I'm not using a homework system. I'm not using what Delta College refers to as e-learning because I don't like to put things behind logins. Basically, this information should be free and publicly available. That's just a personal preference. So if we click on week one, then you would see the outline for week one the assessments that are due, homework or exams, only homework this week. Any handouts that I want you to look at, any videos that I want you to look at, I have a considerable number of videos, and any technology that I want you to use. So we'll go down this week one page shortly. Before I do that, I wanna point you to our syllabus and our resources. First, let's look at the resources. Every week, I'm gonna post a lot of handouts, videos, technology. You can see them all now, but you might ask yourself later, let's click on resources. Oh, where did he put that video? Oh, where did he put that handout? What week was that? Well, in that case, I don't want you to worry because all the things that I post are collected in total on the resources page. So, First, an outline for the entire class, sections that we'll cover in the book. 
Then all of the assessments that are due together with their due dates and their coverage. Notice that all assessments in this class are due at 11.59 p.m. And the idea behind that is just to set one time for every submission. And you'll be submitting homework almost daily. But that way, we don't have to have a difference between exams or homeworks. <coughs> Excuse me. Three exams in this class. The dates are listed here. And the sections covered are listed here. We'll talk more about exams. Not today. Let's, let's not overburden you. But at least you know when they're coming up. I'll talk to you about the scheduled exams later. But you will just simply download the exam from this page or the weekly page. The instructions will be posted here as a link. And then after the exam is graded and returned to you, solutions will be posted here. Handouts. I have kind of a couple of announcements that you might be interested in, particularly in this semester, the tutoring center or the honors program. The math department sponsors a couple of awards, which you're welcome to read about. Uh, but the tutoring center does have some services available to you. I think your first uh, resource is yourselves, your classmates and me, but the tutoring center does sometimes have useful services for classes. I don't know exactly how they service this class, but you're welcome to ask them. Some of you are in the process of getting the textbook. You need the textbook now. If you have mailing issues where the textbook hasn't arrived yet. That's why I kind of emailed you a couple weeks before the class began. Here are the first six sections of the textbook posted. If you click on that link, you'll see that section of the textbook. I'm sure that I'm not entirely allowed to do this, certainly not allowed to do it for an extended time. So I've posted here the sections of the book you need for the first two days of the class. By that time, you need to have the book in your possession. And you could purchase a PDF copy of this book. I don't have any problem with that. That'll be fully useful since you're going to be online or on your computer often anyway. Next, we'll see class session notes. So every day as we work on the paper, all the notes that I write, I will later scan and post here as class session notes in case you say, well, what did he do last Thursday? You know, you can go look it up. You can find a link to all class session notes here. And that will take you to a Google Drive folder where I'll have all the session notes if you want to download or scan particular ones at your leisure. Office hour notes similarly. So uh, the office hours before this class today, no one was present, and that's OK. And so I'll take May 24th off this list. But if you show up to the office hour, I do not record that. I'd rather just interact with you personally. But we will write notes on pieces of paper. And I will scan all the paper that I write. And I'll post it under office hour notes in case someone later wants to come by. Or you say to someone, oh, I asked him that question in the office hours yesterday. So you can see all notes for office hours here. Lecture notes. And I know I'm droning on, but you're going to have to be patient. Uh, these are my personal lecture notes, and I post them here as a service. I do not say that they're exceptional. Your book is exceptional, and the notes that I present are going to be directly from the book. But just, you know, maybe for my benefit as much as for yours, I post the lecture notes that I keep from each section. So if we talk about sections one, 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 two, and one, three today, you can read my lecture notes. They're not exceptional, but they're just basically what I consider to be important in the book. They were written for me, not for you, as if I was giving a lecture in a classroom. But if you click on a section, you'll get a copy of the lecture notes that I prepared for that section. Some of them are more neatly written, like this one. Some of them are less neatly written. Some of them are many years old. Some of them have scribblings on it from when child or children's attacked them. So I make no warranty about the quality of these notes other than they were inspired by the book and they were the things that I wrote down that I wanted to talk about when I talked about those sections in the classroom. 
that's what lecture notes mean. Technology tips, how to download and install Mathematica. You need to get onto that right away. So I'll just let you read that and execute that. Uh, there is software that comes with this book sometimes called DE tools or differential equations tools. It's very nice software. It's very limited, but it, it basically addresses all the questions in the book. So when the authors say, use the HPG solver to blank, they were referring to the software that they originally had a company in this book. It used to come on a CD attached to the book. And nowadays the publisher wants to make you buy it for an extra $50. But sometimes you can find a used copy of the book that has the code still in it. You do not need the DE tool software. I think it's nice. Maybe sometime I'll demonstrate it. But everything that the book asks you to do with technology, you can do with calculator or with Mathematica or with Desmos. And that's how we'll demonstrate it. If you use calculators, uh, the calculator I use most commonly is TI-89. Many people enjoy using the TI-Inspire nowadays. I just never left the TI-89. So here are instructions for doing some minor things that we'll talk about today, slope fields on the TI-89. You can usually find some young person on YouTube who has demonstrated how to do anything on a calculator on a TI Inspire. So you're welcome to use any calculating device you have access to. I don't know too much about the TI Inspire, but I'd be welcome to take your question and try to answer it. But you might be able to compare what I wrote here for the TI-89. So these are instructions that tell you how to make a slope field. This is section 1.3 on your TI-89. Okay, again, more handouts. And some of these handouts are really like golden. So remember, this is the resources page where I'm listing every single handout for the course, which goes on for a little while, right? On each weekly page, I only post the handouts that refer to that week. So just the first three or four handouts here are relevant to what we're doing in the first week. Videos, again, I have a lot of videos. This week, you could focus on the first principles, the mixing problem, Euler's method, phase line bifurcation, and up to the method of the integrating factor. Each one of these videos is about two minutes to three minutes long. It's posted on YouTube. Now let's look for a particular solution. I don't want to listen to my voice right now. So, uh, but literally, okay, this is a long one. It's four minutes and 58 seconds. That is unusual. But I must have been talking about something where I went on too long. The video is kind of a good way to relive what we did on that topic. And these are very, very focused. So don't go through a week unless you look at all the videos pertaining to that week. Like today, major topic will be the MVP of ODEs. So that video, if you forget what I was talking about there, here's a quick, is a two minute and 17 second video to remind you what we were talking about. Basically, my philosophy is I collect a lot of things over the years and I just keep posting them. All these things are very relevant. Okay, so I have a lot of videos. Again, that's the whole course in videos. Every week, we'll have a subset of these on your weekly web page. Last step. So we're on the resources page here too. See the breadcrumbs at the top of the column, resources. In technology, we're gonna use lots of devices to illustrate our differential equations work. And there are many, many applications out there. I make a nice list of them for you in the syllabus. Uh, really the principal ones we're gonna use are Excel, Mathematica, and Desmos. GeoGebra is a fun program. I've posted a couple samples here. It's a free program, but I don't expect, or I don't even suggest that you invest any time in learning GeoGebra unless you already love GeoGebra for some reason. It's a nice program. It runs out of juice pretty quickly in this class because we have to 
illustrate some more sophisticated things. Desmos is extremely flexible. And so you can see I have a lot of examples posted here to illustrate things throughout the course. Desmos is really focused on graphing. It doesn't offer you every single feature that a full powered application like Mathematica would, but it is very flexible. And so often if you wanna just graph something or illustrate something or do a little animation for something, Desmos is very useful. We'll demonstrate that throughout the course. Excel, probably the single greatest computer program ever written. Maybe enough to forgive Bill Gates for all his other uh, indiscretions. I'm a solidly Macintosh person. So, uh, and, and then all Bill Gates fans point out that Bill Gates probably single-handedly rescued Macintosh when, uh, when Steve Jobs came back to try to save the company. Let's put our differences aside. Excel is an incredible program for organizing and presenting information. And we're going to use it actively in this class uh, starting tomorrow. And there's a homework problem posted where you'll use this Excel spreadsheet right here. And when you click on this Excel spreadsheet, all you do is you go to uh, Google Drive where I've got Excel spreadsheets. And then you can download the one that you're interested in using, the one that I point you to. So all this information that you could download is presented on a Google Drive folder. Mathematica is the workhorse in this class. Mathematica is a computer algebra system. There are several computer algebra systems that are powerful and popular. Big three are Mathematica, MATLAB, and Maple. Any reputable college will have a site license to one or all of those programs. Delta College has a site license for Mathematica. You have the instructions for downloading and installing it presented earlier, and it's also in our syllabus. But I don't want you to learn this alone, so I've posted a lot of Mathematica notebooks here throughout the course. You can experiment on your own. And the best way to experiment in Mathematica is to go into their help menu and just ask a question and copy and paste some of their samples. But I'm providing you with other samples here. And maybe we'll open up one later today. <coughs> okay, that's a quick tour of the resources page. <coughs> I don't want you to remember anything on that page, except that if you need it and you forgot where I put it, it's on the resources page. I hate going through the legal stuff just because it's too boring, but let's take a look at our syllabus. Then hopefully we can get to work. We're not wasting too much time here, but we're wasting some. Okay, this is our syllabus. Description of course, instructor, expectations, and grading. So I'm gonna entirely let you read this, uh, except that it's got key links, instructions for downloading, installing Mathematica under required materials. Uh, you need to hand in homework to me. You want to hand them in as PDF files. Hand in your homework as a single PDF file. I do not want to assemble your homework for you. I will not assemble your homework for you. Please write your name on your homework. Even though you submit it through that Dropbox folder, it still comes to me as a document with a lot of writing on it. If your name is not on it, I can figure out whose paper it is. But same way as if you were in a classroom, put a name on it. Microsoft Lens, Apple Notes, and Adobe Scan are programs that easily create PDFs. Uh, I use Apple Notes, Microsoft Lens is useful. I am not a big fan of Adobe. Ever since the Steve killed off. Uh, what was that program that used to be so famous? Flash Player, Flash Player the single greatest installer of malware in the history of the internet. Okay, other useful things, TI-89 graphing calculator. If I pull out a calculator, that's probably what I'll demonstrate with. And our official course dates are listed here. The only exception to our course dates, remember next Monday, one week from today is Memorial Day, there's no class session and no office hours. Instructor, that's me. 
David, Dave is fine. Best way to reach me is by email. Again, here's a link to our office hours and a link to our website. And those are the two most important things. Uh, I will check my office phone once in a while, but there's just no point in calling it because I'm never in my office. If you had to mail something to me, that's the place you'd mail it to, but I don't think you're gonna mail anything to me right now. Electronic communication is fine. And these are my expectations. You have expectations too, which I will respect, but I gotta start by telling you my expectations. And chief among them is I will use your Delta College email address ex exclusively. This is a kind of a procedure of the college and it kind of makes sense for me just to keep track of things. So I don't mind if you email me from another email address, but I will answer to your Delta College email address. Uh, I don't mind if you send me any kind of questions on emails. I'll answer them in the order they appear, usually within 24 hours. This semester, I'm experimenting with a Google group. And that Google group will allow you to kind of act like a discussion board. And so far, all of your responses indicate that you did see the message on the Google group at the beginning of the course. So post messages there I don't mind if you work together on any problems except for an exam. And in this online environment, it's kind of hard to share and I don't want to pass out lists of emails. So I created this Google group for people to share and comment and discuss anything you like without necessarily having to put your emails in the public. Office hours, steps to success. This is how I think you should approach the course. Recommended problems will demonstrate in a second. Every section I list a lot of recommended problems. But generally I'm giving you a homework of one problem per section that I've created. We'll look at the difference between recommended problems and homework problems in a second. Assessments, that's homeworks and exams. I've already demonstrated how to use the assignments folder. Uh, organize your pages clearly, include your name on each paper number of papers, et cetera, et cetera. The more organized you are, the faster I can read it, the faster I can read it. The quicker you get it back in, actually literally the better your grade is. So be organized. Just because it's easier to read something where I don't have to hunt for things. Homework rules, you can consult with me or anyone in the class on any homework problem but you have to prepare and submit your solution by yourself. Uh, I have people that type things. I don't think you need to do that, but uh, you submit the solution yourself, handwritten, typed, whatever. Include all graphs that are necessary, but put them in the single document. Don't send in the homework solution and the six pictures JPEG file. No, everything for homework or exam submission is one PDF file. The exams are your own individual work. It has to be answered, prepared, and submitted by you alone. But we'll talk about exams later. Let's not overburden you on that question. Uh, technology I'm using is a computer algebra system, Mathematica, and Desmos, most likely. You're welcome to use lots of different applications. Someone pointed out to me this application called Slopes recently. And so this is the homepage for this. It was created by some math people at another institution. You can have this on an Apple device or on an Android device. And uh, it does a very good job of illustrating things. It doesn't have the raw solving power, but it does illustrate things nicely. Play with it. I don't mind if you play with it. But you want to invest some time working in Mathematica. GeoGebra, I'm not going to spend time demonstrating, but just in case you were a GeoGebra fan, I included some GeoGebra files. Wolfram Alpha is always kind of effective. It's a little more of a Wikipedia for math than it is like how to do something, although sure, it shows you steps for doing things, but it doesn't always give you the background. Uh, assessment deadlines, as we've discussed, 11.59 p.m., on the dates that are stated. Okay, grading is even simpler. We got some homework problems, we got some exams, 
and that's all your grade consists of. 30 homework problems, 30, 32, 34 problems will probably assign in the semester on the order of one per section. Each problem's worth five points and I'll take your top 24 problems and that'll be worth 120 points. You have three written exams, each exam is 60 points, that'll total 180 points. If you want to see how your points and stuff are added together, every week I will give you a grade report. And I'll talk more about that on another day. I wanna keep this stuff to a minimum today. But every week I will provide you with a grade report and you can make sure I recorded everything correctly and you can see what your current grade is. Your letter grade for the course is based on those points and those points alone. And there's the scale for the grading. Uh, just a short preview. What I'm going to do is create a Google Drive folder for each of you. Uh, it'll look like something like this, except uh, I don't have anything in my Google Drive folder. It'll just be a place where I return your graded papers and your grade reports. So every week or every day that I grade something, you can count on me grading things daily. Uh, I'll say to you, okay, papers are posted in your Google Drive folder. Or every week, okay, grade reports are posted in your Google Drive folder. Then you will take that Google Drive folder link and you go retrieve your papers. I provide you with a link to your folder. I do not password protect this folder. If you pass out the link to your folder, other people will read your papers the same way as if you shared them in a classroom. So don't share the link to your folder unless that's what you intend to do. I don't recommend it. And it's just a way for me to return papers without emailing files back and forth, which is always a risky business. Okay, that was unfortunate. And as my paper said, not short enough tour of the website. And we're still not done going through the website. But if there is any question, if you're still alive, if you're still awake, you can toss them in the chat window and I will answer them as they come up. We're very close to talking about content now. So don't give up on me yet. But now you know that after we're done, we'll scan and post these pages, number them, title them, and they'll be on our website. Okay, back to web page for just one more thing. And then we can have some fun. Okay, that was a syllabus. Please read the syllabus. Uh, that's the rules of the course. You want to know exactly what the rules of the course are. But if we go into week one, let's take a look at what we're gonna do this week and how things are laid out. You got the outline, which is unapologetically nine sections long. We're gonna talk about three sections today, three sections on Tuesday and three sections on Wednesday. Here's your first assessments, homework and exams, that's it. But you have homework due tomorrow and the three problems are listed right here. These three problems are from the book or from the book altered. So for example, section 1.1 number 16 is a problem that I just literally copied from the book. I did not alter this problem in any way, but I put that paper up there just in case someone wants to download and write on the paper. Save you the trouble of re rewriting the question, so to speak. But often I'll take a problem and alter it, like section 1310. So this is probably like problem 10 in section one, three, but it's probably been slightly altered. Okay, so you see, I got some lag issues right there. So well, I wanted to show it to you and I will show it to you when it comes, but don't do problem one, three in the book. Do this problem one, three, 10 alternate version. So the exercises that I want you to hand in, I'm not gonna wait for this. Oh, then, then it shows up. This is a slightly altered version 
of problem 10 in section 1-3, or maybe moderately altered. But again, I just retype the problem so you don't have to copy the problem. You can just write your solution on here, or you can attach your solution to here separately. I don't mind. So you have three homeworks that are due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. Remember, that's the common due time. 1116, 1235 alt, 1310. Here's the homeworks that are due on the next day. I haven't finished uploading them. Then I'll do some more for Thursday. We're on the habit of doing about one problem for every section while we're doing three sections in these first days of the first two weeks. We'll do three problems a day. It's a little bit intense at the beginning. To help you out, do you see that in each section, I've listed recommended problems. Not every problem in the section, but just the ones I recommend because I think they're useful. And do you see that there are links on each one of the recommended problems? For example, here's 1310. If I follow that link, I will go to problem 1310 that was in the textbook which was a little bit shorter than the one I've posted, but here's a solution to problem 1310. Not very long, not very exciting. Let's look for a more interesting one. How about, oh, 1.2 number 40. Oh, that's, okay, that's a fun problem. Where I actually wrote down a solution that you can practice following. So you're gonna learn by imitating. Unfortunately, that's the only thing you can do in general to learn something. How did you learn how to drive a car? You imitated someone driving a car. Same thing here, except we gotta do it at a very fast pace. So pay attention to all the recommended problems and all the solutions that I've posted here because they'll give you demonstrations of how problems could be solved and the kind of thinking I want you to do. This is overwhelming at the beginning, but this is a good resource for studying for exams or preparing homework problems. And on the homework problems, you see I said 1235 alt. So maybe there's a problem here called 1235. Okay, it's not turned on. That means I don't have a solution, but here's a solution for 1, 2, 34, which might be similar, right? So use these recommended problems as resources, but I'm not gonna sit here and wait for this to load over my internet connection. Okay, so you got the outline, you got the recommended problems, you got posted solutions. Every day you're gonna hand in homework but let's think about this really carefully. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will present material. And the next day you hand in the homework on that material. Thursday, I will not present any new material. Thursday, I will dedicate only to demonstrating problems and answering your questions. And since there's no new material on Thursday, there's no homework that I assigned for the following session. So your weekends are your own, but you're gonna be doing a lot of studying and reading during those weekends. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, present. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, hand in homework. Thursday, I answer your questions and do demonstrations for you in our class time even if you cannot attend the class session live, you're working on this stuff daily and you can send in the questions for the Thursday session, okay? That's my intention. So even if you're not communicating with me in real time, like some of you are now, you send in questions for the Thursday session, we demonstrate them. I will demonstrate other problems that I think are important but that's the kind of like catch your breath pause day. Okay. Exams we'll talk about when they come up, but you notice that one is coming up relatively soon. 
handouts. These are the handouts for this week. And do read each one of these handouts because they are golden. Uh, basic separable equations examples. Here I did eight differential equations, wrote out nicely, explained nicely, and each one of these eight is unique in some way. So they'll give you a good overview for this first chapter. So that's a great handout. Every one of these handouts is a great handout. Uh, Euler's method we'll talk about next time, but here's a problem in Euler's method. And then after you do that problem, uh, I guess I'm not gonna depend on thing to load for me. There's a solution to that problem posted right next to it. Okay, so here's a solution to that worksheet. So the first thing is blank. The second thing is the solution. Uh, when we get into first order linear equations, sections 1819, this handout is relevant. Okay. It's not bad to demonstrate this. Obviously, I don't have a good link to this file. So if you come across a situation like that, let me know. But I'll make a note about it and fix that link later. Here's the videos for this first week. A healthy handful of videos. Watch each one of them. They are on the order of two to four minutes long. And then here's technology that we're gonna use this week. Some Excel spreadsheets, some Desmos demonstrations, some Mathematica notebooks. Again, uh, don't pay attention to your GeoGebra stuff unless you've got like serious time to kill or you love GeoGebra. Maybe you've used it before. Okay, now we may have done the whole tour of the website. And I apologize for that length. In fact, we're probably gonna take a break shortly. The issue is here, this is very unlike being in a classroom and I appreciate that. And I appreciate probably all you've gone through in the last year and how you've probably gotten better and better at consuming material in different ways. I've gotten better at producing it and delivering it but there's nothing I can do to reproduce a classroom in this format. So I don't even know what the right demonstration of this is. Is this like a radio show where you come to hear someone talk about differential equations? Is this a traditional lecture? You know, I really don't know what this is. I'm simply trying to do the best for you I can. Every semester I improve the format. So comments of previous students have improved the format that you're consuming now. But I know that this is not simple or comfortable. The most important thing for you to do is to be current and to keep up with what we're doing every day as much as you can. And it will become easier as you go along. Okay, like I said, it was not short enough. <laughs> but now we can go on and actually do differential equations. Now we can actually have fun. These recordings are two hours long. I always, even if I was in a classroom, take a break at the top of the hour. So I'm about to take a break here. Just let you get up, stretch your legs. And I'll mute my microphone and do the same for five minutes. But before I do that, and before we go to a break, you can either bring a question here on audio or in the chat, or during the break, you can throw questions on the chat and I'll come back and answer them for you. So right now, the questions that I'm soliciting are just kind of procedural questions. If there's anything you need to know about the course or how the course is run and uh, if I don't answer them here, I'll answer them individually. Oh, uh, all kinds of questions occur to me, but I won't think of all of them. Typical question people say, 
I'm recording this session, but I do not record the chat. So what shows up in the chat is only the things you type. I don't make a record of them. Uh, yeah, I could, you could chat me personally in the chat box. I could respond to you personally. That's fine as time permits, but I'm not making a recording of the chat or keeping a record of it. Is there anything I can do for you before we take our first break? Is there any question that has occurred to your now glazed over mind? We will have some fun, so you'll get used to my sense of humor. Okay, then I will do this. You can always ask introduction questions, but for today, the introduction is over. And let's say, I want you to take a break. If you're still here, I'll come back at 1 p.m. I'm gonna stretch my legs. You should do the same because we're all sitting way too long. I'm gonna mute my microphone and be back at 1 p.m. Thank you.
Okay, back to work. Again, I can't apologize enough, or if I keep apologizing, I'll waste more time, but now let's actually do some differential equations. The better I can orient you, the faster we'll be able to start. So that's why I spent the time we did. So what is modeling? What is a differential equation? Modeling is kind of a modern way to say you're gonna use mathematics to do something. I mean, you're observing something in nature and you say, well, the, the number of petals on that flower is eight. The number of petals on the next flower is, is 13. I've never seen a flower with 12 petals. Is there a reason for that? Well, yeah, there's kind of a mathematical reason for that. And you can Google this later, it's called the Fibonacci sequence. But when someone asks you to model something, they're asking you to use some scientific process. Well, for us, will be mathematical process to see if you can explain what you're observing in nature or elsewhere. Differential equations, we're about to write down our first differential equation, but it's, it's a, an equation that includes a derivative. Equations are for solving. You've solved lots of equations in your life. You know, 2x minus 1 equals 7. That's an equation. It's a statement equating two quantities. Even without instructions, you're likely to say x equals 4 because you're so used to solving equations. Solving means, in this sense, this sentence is neither true nor false. Depending on the value of x, it could be true or false. You have been trained so drastically to just look at an equation and find the number that makes the sense true. Solving the equation means finding the number that makes the sense true, which in this case is four. The differential equation is likewise simply an equation, but the unknown quantity isn't a number. The unknown quantity is usually a function. So it's a little more sophisticated equation. So let's take a look at a very simple model that I can express with a differential equation. And this is not an uncommon expression. You probably even know what this is called. If someone says to you, the rate of growth of a population is proportional to the size of the population. That's a pretty mellow assumption. You know, rabbits on an island, mold on bread, money in your bank account. All of those things grow proportional to the number of rabbits or mold or money that's present. This is a differential equation. I can tell because it says rate of growth. Rate of growth of what? A population. Where's the equal sign? Is. So let's start translating this into a differential equation. The rate of change of population with respect to time is proportional to the size of the population. Let's let P be population here. Now it doesn't say the rate of growth is equal to the population. It says the rate of growth is proportional to the size of the population. So I introduce a constant of proportionality that I call K. Now I've got this sentence, it's got five letters in it already. So I'm starting to get dizzy. I used to only have one letter. But let's look at this really carefully and discuss this carefully. This says the rate of change of population with respect to time is a constant times the population. I haven't told you what this constant is yet. Maybe it depends on the population. Rabbits multiply this fast. Money multiplies this fast. Mold grows this fast. This constant of proportionality probably depends on the things that I'm talking about. So the P here is called the population in this problem. The population is what I call the dependent variable. It's the thing that I'm measuring. The T represents time. Here, time is referred to as the independent variable. It's the 
measuring stick that I'm using. The D is not a variable at all. The D is notation for a derivative. Leibniz is notation for a derivative. The rate of change, the little change in P divided by the little change in time. The K here, maybe we'll kind of commonly call it the growth constant. You're off the screen. Oh, very good. Thank you. When I'm flowing, when I'm rolling, I'm much better at that. But you and I have both had a two week break, right? Very good. Thank you very much. Interrupt me at any time. Uh, let's be careful about the what we call this K. Legally, it's a variable, right? Unless I tell you what its value is. But it's not the variable I'm studying. I'm really hunting for this population formula. This P that I'm hunting for is a function. It's not a number. Because the derivative of a number is zero. I'm hunting for this unknown function P, which depends on time, depends on time. And the constant we already acknowledge probably is different for different kinds of populations. In this case, we have a special word for this. This is called a parameter. I'm not being silly. You have to be able to distinguish between the variables you're using and the parameters that change from problem to problem. So let's state a very mellow problem here. Let's like say I deposited, and let's look at this visually first. At time equals zero, I deposited a certain number of rabbits on the island. And uh, let's say I deposited a positive number of rabbits on the island, 10 rabbits, 10 dozen rabbits, 10 boatloads of rabbits. Do you know what I'm gonna say here? Units are something that we have to pay attention to, but I'm not gonna focus on units yet. Time, do we measure time in seconds, years, milliseconds, centuries? Let's make no commitments right now. Let's just say that at some time I deposited a positive number of rabbits on the island. And let's say that the growth parameter at this moment is a positive number. What can I learn only by looking at this equation? We'll solve it in a second, but let's just look at it. If the K is a positive number and the P is a positive number at any time, then multiply two positive numbers, the rate of change will be positive. What happens when rate of change is positive? That quantity is increasing. When I come back later, there will be what? More rabbits on the island. And at that time then, I measure the number of rabbits on the island and I multiply by that positive growth parameter. And what do I get? Another positive growth rate, but this time, since the P is larger, the growth rate will be larger. And when I come back later, there'll be what? More rabbits on the island. Now you might think I'm just spitballing this, but on the other hand, if I continued this argument, what would I learn? The population of rabbits seems to be growing, you have a word for it, exponentially. In fact, this phrase that I just wrote down, the rate of growth of a population is proportional to the size of the population, that's commonly referred to as exponential growth. Let's show you how super flexible this is. Do you know that you started out with 10 rabbits on that island or 10 truckloads of rabbits? What happens if you go backwards in time? Well, according to the slope of that line, if you had been at that island a month before or a week before, I don't know what timing it's using, there would have been what? Less rabbits on the island. 
And less rabbits on the island would mean a lesser growth rate. And if you had been there earlier, there would have been even less rabbits on the island. Now let's think about this. I did almost no math. The only thing I referred to is the word slope. Derivative is slope all day. But I've drawn a curve here that you recognize as an exponential growth. You know, uh, e to the something or two to the something. You recognize this as an exponential function. Now that's really interesting. Here's a differential equation. I just solved a differential equation. It's not the kind of solving maybe you're looking for. You'd rather say, well, what's the formula, Dave? But I'm gonna put that off for a second. Let's do some other observations. What about if I had put no rabbits on the island when I visited it? If P is zero, even if K is positive, K times zero is still zero. And then what happens? There is no growth. So when I come back a month later, how many rabbits are on the island? None. And then I come back much later, how many rabbits are on the island? None. Well, I just solved the differential equation again, that if I ever have no rabbits on the island, and, and a month ago, if there's no rabbits on the island now, there must have been no rabbits on the island a month ago, because otherwise they would have multiplied. Now we'll talk about natural disease, we'll talk about predators, we'll talk about food supply later. But I'm just talking about simple rabbits on the island. Oh my gosh, I just solved the differential equation again. Now let's do something really silly, but you gotta humor me. What happens if I had deposited negative rabbits on the island? On my screen camera, this color doesn't come out. I got red, green, blue. When I scan the papers, the color I think will come out better. But if I put ever negative rabbits on that island, don't ask me what a negative rabbit is right now. But if P is negative and K is positive, then what's the growth rate? Negative. When I come back, I don't want to know how to say this because I'm really getting silly. Do I have more negative rabbits or do I have even less rabbits? The, the rabbit population has gone down and then its growth rate will also go down. It'll be larger in magnitude, but smaller in number. And it's the same argument I used on this red line. Just kind of repeated upside down. So here's what I've concluded. This differential equation has three types of solutions. If I start over here with a certain number of rabbits, I think I'm just going to imitate that other red solution. I don't think there's any solution that just waves up and down. I've used the qualities of this formula to describe everything that could happen in this very simple example. And so this differential equation may have thousands, millions, uncountable number of answers, but I know exactly how many types. This is called a qualitative analysis. And the first thing is, uh, tell me the formula, Dave. Tell me the equation, tell me the answer. Well, I wanna open your mind for a second. This is an admittedly simple differential equation. In fact, I can solve it exactly. We'll do that in a second. I can give you a formula for the answer. But I want you to get prepared 
because all the differential equations you meet in your life, you'll only be able to solve a tiny fraction of them exactly. If you cannot solve it analytically, analytically means to give an exact formula to analyze it. An analytic solution would be the solution to this problem. In a second, we'll find out that the solution to this problem is P naught e to the kt. I ran out of room writing on the right side. But there are some solutions that some differential equations that you cannot create a formula for, not even a complicated formula for. We're going to do one more method that we'll focus on more tomorrow. And that is, what if you cannot brute force create the solution and you're not sure that you could describe the qualities like I just did for that problem? Well, then you're up Math Creek, right? Now, the advent of the calculator and computer even before they existed, means that sometimes we can approximate answers numerically. A numerical analysis is building an approximate solution to a problem to gain insight to the quality of the answers that might lead you to an exact formula, okay? So I've said this already in an email. This is a very famous book. It redesigned differential equations. And the authors were well rewarded. If you took this differential equation 20 or 30 years ago or more when I did, you learned differential equations as a cookbook it's just a list of problems that you solved with a list of formulas. And sometimes you had insight and sometimes you didn't. I think that's not fair the way I describe it right there. But it was mostly trying to apply procedures and formulas. <coughs> there was a revolution that happened about 20 years ago where people said, well, you know, that just doesn't get us enough information. Really, we want exact answers when they're available. But maybe I'd just be satisfied with a description of the quality of the answers, like this graph. But some things can be so complicated that I can't even understand what the answers might look like. Well, maybe I could approximate them numerically. And numerical approximations even existed before computer approximations did. But the tool we use most often right now is the computer. Let's take this and do an analytic solution. And even on this very small problem, you'll decide that, wait a minute, I don't think that's worth it. That's too much effort. Analytic solutions are frequently a lot of work because you gotta be like math lawyer. You gotta be like unfrozen math lawyer. If you remember the old Saturday Night Live skits. You gotta be very, very particular. So how can I prove to you that these are actually all the solutions? Let's see if we can build a brute force answer. Okay, here we go. So let's say that uh, K is a positive number. I'll let you choose any positive number you like. And let's say P at time zero is P naught. Again, I don't want to commit you to how many rabbits you put on the island. P naught is a very common way of saying the initial value, the initial P value. Here it's the initial P value when time is equal to zero. Let's solve this differential equation. Oh, by the way, 
P naught is what kind of thing? It's not a number yet until I tell you what it is. Remember our words right here? P naught is a parameter. It's not the variable we're searching for. It's some number, like how many rabbits did you put on the island at the beginning? So now I've introduced another parameter. Well, the technique that I'm gonna illustrate here is from section 6.2, it's called separation of variables. And it is a very common analytic technique. If you have an equation that's quote unquote separable, then you have a path to an analytic solution. Doesn't mean you're gonna succeed, but you have a chance. Separable or separation of variables means you can gather all of the dependent variables on one side of the equation and all of the independent variables on the other. And so I'll do right now. dp divided by p, I divide both sides by p, and I multiply both sides by dt. I just separated the variables. Remember, this is a very basic example, so don't expect too many fireworks. But interesting things are about to happen. You say, you can't do that. You can't separate dp, dt, and that's, that's not a fraction. That's an instruction. It's called differentiation. I say, get over it. You separated them when you did integration in Calc 2, right? So let's just pretend it's a fraction that I can separate into two different variable pieces. The value of this is maybe now I can integrate both sides. Remember, k is a constant. Integrate with respect to t. This would be equal to k times t plus a constant. Don't ignore the constant. Over here, integrate 1 over p with respect to p. Well, you need to remember some of your calc 2. That's the natural log of the absolute value of p, right? Plus a constant. Now, in calculus, sometimes you never wrote that plus C. Well, now you need to write it because it's actually important. But what I did here, I don't think that's very legal. Like, uh, should they be the same C? I don't think so. There's no reason they should be the same constant. But any constant is legitimate here. We're not gonna do this in practice, but for a moment, let me name them constant one and constant two, just so you understand that I understand they're not the same constant. Okay, here we are. This is now no longer a differential equation. This is an equation that's got a p in it. Maybe I could solve this for p. C1 and C2 right now are any real number. I'm gonna slowly solve for p by unwrapping the things that are restraining it. First thing I'll do is subtract C1 from both sides. But I don't want to write C2 minus C1. Let's think about it this way. If C2 is any number under the sun and C1 is any other number under the sun, what happens when you subtract them? You just create some other number. So C3 right here legally is any real number. Now I'm doing this way too slow and way too legalistically, but there's a point to it. If I wanna know what P is, what do I gotta do next? Remove that log, natural log. How do you remove natural log? You exponentiate, right? Exponentiate the left-hand side, exponentiate the right-hand side. Whatever you do onto one side, you do onto the other. Isn't that the golden rule of math? But be very careful how you write this now. On this side, I just have the absolute value of P. On this side, be careful how you express that constant. Legally, this is EKT times E to the C3. Because what happens when you have a common base? You add exponent. But if C3 is any number under the sun, you know what exponential graph looks like, right? E to the C3 
is a new number. Let's call it C4. Don't worry, it's not explosive. C4 is no longer any number under the sun. C4 is a positive number. Now, like I say, I'm doing this way too legalistically, but be patient with me. Now I'm very close to discovering what P is. I've almost got a formula for P, but I am not looking at P. I'm looking at the absolute value of P. So I have to remove that absolute value before I can discover what P is. Well, the same way as you remove the absolute value in this case. And you don't have to say it out loud. I'll say it out loud for you. Or you could type it in the chat, I don't mind. If I ask you absolute value of X equal to four, what X is, well, you were trained to deal with absolute value. You were trained to respond, well, I've got two chances, either X is four or X is minus four. And likewise here, when I remove that absolute value, I finally discovered what P is. It's either plus or minus C4 e to the KT. But I'm gonna rewrite that with a new constant, C5. Now remember C4 was any positive number. What happens when I stick a plus or minus in front of it? Legally, I only get the numbers that are not zero. One more step and I'm done. This is not all I know. Remember, P of zero is my parameter P naught, how many rabbits I put on the island initially. So what I could do is now it's time to discover what that constant is. If I put zero in place of T, there's a T inside this function. I've not been displaying it yet. But P, the population does clearly depend on time. And if I put zero in place of T, getting too low again, I can discover what C5 is. Because E to the K times zero is one. And P of zero, was P naught. So what did we just discover? P naught is C5 times one. In other words, C5 is P naught. And I've just solved my first differential equation. And you don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> Let's think about that. Were we successful? Moderately successful. Something has gone wrong and we haven't paid attention to it yet. But here we found the general solution to our problem and it indeed was an exponential. Let's go back to our picture. Remember how I said C5 could be any positive number or any negative number? Well, now we're ecstatic. We're over the moon because do you see that I predicted positive exponential functions and negative exponential functions? My qualitative analysis said I might have upside down exponential growth. That would be the C5 being negative number. Here, P naught must be my what? Initial value of rabbits I put on the island. Now I said I was almost successful, right? Because there was a third type of answer. And it looks as if I lost it. Remember, legally, I specifically forbid C5 from being zero. And therefore it looks like when I solved the differential equation, I lost this possibility which by the way is a very real possibility. No rabbits on the island, you come back next month, there are no rabbits on the island. Unless one rabbit like swam. 
from another island while expecting. We'll deal with odd situations like that later. No, we're very, very nervous. What about this function? This function clearly solves the differential equation. The function that's constantly zero has zero derivative. And k times the function that's constantly zero is equal to zero. So my answer doesn't predict this. I have failed. Or did I fail? Well, it's not that my work didn't predict it. It's that I didn't point it out to you when it happened. Where did I overlook this answer? Let's go back to the top. In the very first step, when I divided both sides by zero, What did I forget to say in my legal brief? Dividing by P is legal. As long as P is not zero. So as long as I go back and investigate that, I just investigated it, it works. I predicted it. I'm satisfied. As long as I go back and investigate it, I now believe I know every solution to this differential equation. C e to the kt and C can be any real number. Now let's think about this because you're not gonna like what I'm about to say. That was a heck of a lot of work for a tiny differential equation, right? That was our very first differential equation. I don't think I could make it any smaller than that. And if I did it by the book with this analytic solution, I had to do a lot of things very particularly. But now let's look on the bright side. Having done that problem with simple parameters and letters, what if that was a Q instead of a P? What if that was an M instead of a K? I now know the answer to this problem for all time. And this problem is called the most valuable problem in differential equations. It's the MVP of ODEs, ordinary differential equations. I haven't told you what ordinary means yet. I will in a second. So for example, if I write down to you, dz dt is negative 0.3z and z of zero is seven. I don't want you to repeat the work that I just did. And this is why you have to watch the video. I just want you to tell me the answer. This is the most valuable problem in differential equations for a good reason. It doesn't matter what I call the letters. I could use S instead of T. This is an example of the MVP of ODEs. Now, I'd like you to be able to do this. In fact, there's nothing I did right here that wasn't just ordinary calculus and common sense. But I cannot afford, you cannot afford to do things one step at a time like this every time right? You're kind of happy you got an exact formula. I'm kind of saying you should look at it the other way. It cost you a lot to write that formula. And if the problem was harder, do you think you could have still succeeded? Would it have been worth it? 
This is an analytic solution, but what I've shown you already is that sometimes analytic solutions are not worth it or not attainable. Let's try another one. Now, I just did an example from section eight, uh, section 1.2, that was called separation of variables. Let's look at another example of a qualitative analysis. We're not doing too badly today, time-wise, but obviously we were pressed from the time we spent organizing. How about let's redo the problem we just did. The rate of growth of a population, I'll abbreviate, is proportional to the population the size of the population. But now I'm gonna alter it. While the population is small, and now I'm gonna get mean. But if the population becomes too large, population it will decrease. Now, what did I say about, you know, we're gonna talk about food shortages. We're gonna talk about predators, you know, slowly, one at a time. But here is another very common physical thing that we observe, and we'd like to represent it with a differential equation, rate of growth. You know very well that if you put 10 rabbits on that island, that they'll grow and grow and grow. But the island has finite resources. So at some time, the rabbits are gonna run out of space. The rabbits are gonna run out of food. We're not even gonna talk about predators yet. But the rabbits running out of space causes their population to decline. The growth rate will not be so great anymore. Let's try and write this as a differential equation. Now, I'm gonna follow what he presented in the book, but that does not mean that there's not another way to do this. But, so let's start out with population growth is proportional to population. That's great. But how can I discuss this too large? How could I make the growth rate negative? When I write this down, you're gonna say, you just made that up. You just pulled that out of your hat. So I did, but let's introduce a new parameter. One over P, one minus P over N. Remember K was the growth rate? Let's say N is the so-called carrying capacity. How many rabbits can this island support? You know, I don't know how many, but I do know, I do acknowledge that there's not gonna be a 20 billion rabbits on this island someday, even on a large island. Well, now what do I got? I got a new differential equation. And do you understand that if P is a small number, then P over N is small, and this is nearly one. So I'm just looking at ordinary exponential growth. But if P becomes large, like bigger than N, if they overpopulate, then P over N, if P is bigger than N, then this number is bigger than one. One minus that number is negative. And then I'll have positive number, positive number, negative number, negative growth rate. 
What happens if P just becomes 90% of capacity? Well, then this P over N is 0.9. One minus 0.9 is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is a small fraction. And so this growth rate becomes small. Let's draw those. Let's do a qualitative analysis. Here's my rabbits. Here's my carrying capacity. That'll be the constant N. P equals N. Let's say I start off with a small number of rabbits on the island. And at first I'm growing. It seems exponentially. But as this P becomes closer and closer to N, this term becomes more significant. And what happens? The growth rate, while still positive, slows down. I can still say as before, there used to be less rabbits on the island. But now I have a new curve here. This is not an exponential curve. This is actually called a logistic curve. And what we're talking about is referred to as logistic growth. What happens if I started with too many rabbits on the island? Well, then this factor is legitimately negative and my population is going down. But when I come back, I'm not so overpopulated. So my population goes down less quickly. And every time I come back, I have less population. What does the population do? Decay to N. N is the carrying capacity. N is what? A kind of a stable equilibrium. In fact, if there are ever N rabbits on the island, there's no reason for their numbers to increase or decrease. You see N is an equilibrium solution. What are the formulas for these curves? I have no idea. Well, you know, we could do it. We could actually do it, but it would be a heavy amount of work. There is a solution posted on the website. Let's talk about another equilibrium. What if there were zero rabbits on the island? Well, of course, there will always be zero rabbits on the island then. What if there are negative rabbits on the island? Again, there'll be more negative rabbits when you come back. Now, part of the posted homework problems and recommended problems go to show you, and we're gonna wrap it up today in a few minutes that it's not so silly to talk about negative rabbits. So we'll come back and talk about this later, maybe not today, but what have I learned about the quality of this differential equation? What I see are one, two, three, four, five types of solutions. This is a stable equilibrium, P equals N because P equals N actually solves this differential equation. P equals zero is also an equilibrium, but solutions peel away from that, don't they? That's called an unstable equilibrium. Just doing a little vocabulary here, don't worry. I have solutions that decay to the stable equilibrium. I have solutions that rise to the stable equilibrium. And then I have solutions that are driven away from the unstable equilibrium. Now, I did this much, much too fast, but you're almost willing to believe that I've solved this differential equation. What I should say is, it sounds plausible what I just said. You're still waiting for the formulas. Well, these I have, I've given you two of the formulas. Aren't you satisfied with that? No, you want the other formulas. And I'm gonna say to you, there's a lot of pain in getting those formulas. What if you don't have time to get those formulas? What if your boss wants to know exactly right now, what's gonna happen three months from now with those rabbits on the island? You don't have time to do the actual 
solution. And it is given in one of the handouts on our website, the logistic growth handout. I've done a qualitative analysis and I have a high degree of confidence that this is what's happening on that island. I gotta keep numbering my pages. I'm gonna do one more quick example very quickly to preview what we're going to do with numerical. So, so far I've done a brute force solution, an analytic solution, very lightweight one. I've done two qualitative analysis. And this qualitative analysis is nothing to sneeze at. That's, I got a lot of information right here about how rabbits behave if you leave them alone with a fixed number of resources. Carrying capacity. Let's do one more thing. Let's get really obnoxious. Let's introduce some foxes to the island. And this is an example of what people call a predator prey system. We're not going to talk about these in great detail until chapter two, but I want to show you, and I will show you more next time, about what a system of differential equations is. What should we say about rabbits? Well, they're just kind of happy-go-lucky. If you leave them alone, they'll grow exponentially. Of course, foxes need food. If you leave them alone with no food, they're likely to die off. So let's call that exponential decay. I didn't use that word before, but you're familiar with exponential decay. But if rabbits and foxes are in the same environment, let's say rabbits and foxes are both positive in number, then whenever rabbits meet the foxes, whenever foxes meet the rabbits, it will detract from the growth of the rabbits. Let's not get too graphic here, but it's clear that if there are both rabbits and foxes on that island, the growth rate of rabbits will be dented, subtracted, declined, whatever word you want to use. On the other hand, the growth rate of foxes will be assisted, supplemented, added to. What I've just written down here, this is where we're going to end it in a few minutes, is called a first order system of ordinary differential equations. And this is, a, the, in some ways, the gold standard. Rabbits and foxes interacting. Now, I hope I don't have any biologists in the audience because Everybody, there's always one person in the audience says, but rabbits, but foxes don't eat rabbits. I understand foxes don't eat rabbits. I'm just using traditional letters and words. You can use any species you want. A species that naturally grows and a species that naturally declines without a food source. But the first species is the food source for the second species. And here's what first order means. I better start defining these words. First order means first derivative, right? This is a first order differential equation, but we will come across differential equations that have two derivatives. N1 derivative, an original function. When you have two derivatives in differential equation, it's called a second order differential equation. We'll do those just later.
you can go as far as you want. You can do third order, fourth order, fifth order, 10th order. You do as many as you want, right? But in a way, second order is sufficient. And I can't explain it to you yet, but we will not do any differential equation other than second order. If you ask why, how do you get to ignore all the others? I'll have to explain that later. Ordinary refers to a straight derivative of a single variable. But you also realize in your calculus class that you could take partial derivatives of a function, right? So what happens if I wrote a differential equation with partial derivatives? Well, then it becomes a partial differential equation, but we are only gonna study ordinary differential equations. If you like, you will in the future study partial differential equations, typical examples, heat flow, fluid flow, and things like that. It depends on what you're interested in. But now let's do a quick analysis of this predator prey system. And I am not ready to solve it. In fact, most often these are unsolvable. Even the simple one that I just wrote down in front of you, there's no power on earth that would grant you a formula for the rabbits and foxes. The fact that they're interacting really, really messes up your ability to construct a solution. But you can't tolerate that because there's lots of things you observe in nature that interact. There's no way you can say, oh, well, I'm just gonna give up because I can't find a formula, right? So let's think about this logically then. Let's put the rabbits on the horizontal axis. Let's put the foxes on the vertical axis. Uh, let's not talk about negative rabbits or foxes right now. I'm in the first quadrant. Both rabbits and foxes are zero or positive. And let's think about what happens if I put a very large number of rabbits on the island, or relatively large, initial rabbits, and only a few foxes, initial foxes. Let's think about what logically will happen to the rabbit fox spaceship, time machine, whatever you want to call it. Well, uh, rabbits will do what rabbits do. And they don't got many foxes around to call them. Rabbit population is going to go that way and fast. Lots of rabbits. Rabbit population is going that way. But the foxes, those that are there, are very satisfied. Lots of food available. Fox population is going to go that way. You know, together, the rabbit population will rise, but so will the fox population. In fact, the fox population will start to take off. Now, let's think about this. When the fox population really starts to take off, what's going to happen to the rabbit population? They're not going to be so happy. They're not going to be growing so fast. You know, they're going to kind of hit a wall. But still, there are plenty of rabbits around. Lots of rabbits. Until what? The foxes start to, the foxes will increase. But the more foxes increase, the more rabbits they consume. Now the rabbit population is going that way. Foxes are still growing because there's lots of rabbits around, but you see a time in the future, don't you? Where the fox population is gonna level off because there's not as many rabbits as there used to be. And then what happens? Fox population will start to decline, but now they've taken the rabbits down way too low, way too low. And now foxes are suddenly looking around hungry and scared. Fox population is going to take a dive, a very steep and fast dive. But as the fox population takes a dive, what do the rabbits do? The few rabbits that are left, they're suddenly not under the same pressure they were, are they? 
fact, the rabbit population starts to recover. Now here's the $100,000 question. Does it start to recover and come back to where it started? Does it start to recover and the fox population never goes that low? You see, I see a cycle happening here. I see an eternal struggle between rabbits and foxes. Now, one way this struggle could end is that they could get back to where they were and they could start all over again. And they could spend eternity going through this cycle called the predator-prey cycle. There are other things that could happen, but this is one thing that could happen. But right now you're saying, you're just making that up. You know, where's the formulas, Dave? Well, I'll tell you, I can't produce the formulas. But with some numerical magic, which we'll demonstrate next time, I could produce simulations that support this drawing. And if my simulations not only support the drawing, but support what I observe in nature, then maybe I'd be satisfied with just the ability to simulate. My numerical approximation has given me a qualitative idea of how the system behaves. So we've done analytic, qualitative, and next time we'll introduce numerical. These are our weapons for solving differential equations. Okay, you've been extraordinary patient and kind. I'm gonna turn off the record button in a second. Usually I turn off the record button, say goodbye, and just start posting things online. I will hang out for some questions off the recording if you like. But we had to spend a little bit too much time laying the groundwork for the course. I can only give you a feeling for what we're gonna do. Now I want you to dive into three homework problems, deliver them late tomorrow night. Remember you have class session and office hours if you wanna ask questions before you deliver them. But this is our plan. Our plan is analytic solutions when they're available, qualitative analysis always so that we know what we're talking about. And when we're totally clueless, maybe we can use some numerical approximations. And that sounds kind of too simple to be working, but it actually turns out to be a very powerful approach. Okay, I'm gonna scan these, post them, post the video, get back to you next time. I'm gonna hit the recording button, turn it off now. If you wanna ask a question, if you still got breath. <laughs>